Good afternoon, everyone. This is Talk Sense Show. Today, we are having a very special guest. His name is Pranav Sharma. He's the co-founder of Woodstock uh, Fund, uh, which is basically a fund who looks uh, closely investing into distributed ledger technologies or blockchain uh, as it goes. Um, Pranav, welcome to the Talk Sense Show. Thank you very much. It's a privilege to be here and talking to you and talking to the audience that you have. Absolutely. So, um, Pranav, your background is basically um, looking back. Uh, you've worked for many years for Aditya Billa Group, uh, which is a huge conglomerate in India, uh, a financial powerhouse. And um, from there, you've taken this big step to come into the world of uh, um, VCs, basically, uh, where you act as VCs and as a fund, um, looking specifically into private equity. Now, before we start off uh, talking about um, the approach your fund has, uh, I also wanted to talk about how's your journey been coming out of a big corporate powerhouse and starting your own fund? Uh, I think this is a very... Uh Good question, and I think I'm going to share you something which is very personal and intimate to me. Uh, as far as you know, my own uh, experience, you know, goes. I have been across financial services the entire spectrum. Uh, with, within Aditya Birla Group, I was also part of uh, strategy uh, for a significant time. I was in the chemical business in Bangkok also, and there, you know, sort of you know working on the strategy around the security. So I've been across the spectrum. In this entire spectrum, I deserved that. Uh, I, I, I sort of, you know, figured out that this entire conglomerate is too big, and after a point in time, uh, large organizations find it very difficult to engage across the board. I grew through the ranks within this organization. I got amazing mentors. A lot of people supported. I was part of a talent group, wherein I used to have interaction with Mr. Birla once in a while. So I had that privilege. I have autograph and you know, signed. I really look up to him still. Uh, but what I discovered is that there is. Uh, aspiration. Mm -hmm. There was an aspiration, there was uh, a certain level of uh, desire to express my talent. And I won't say that I'm like talented as you are, <laughs> but uh, you know, my thing is that let's say I wanted to make in investing and let's say spotting good people and good teams was always my strength. Building strategy and making it happen was the another strength you know, that I had. Putting things across into simple ways and connecting all of this together was my strength which, which I always you know discovered and built over a span of time and then I realized that in a large organization because I was confined to a specific role I could not express it okay. kind of point and uh, I rose through the ranks I was you know heading SME business which is small and mid-sized enterprise business uh, across the insurance business vertical of uh, Aditya Billa group and uh, then I realized that you know I can't you know go beyond this yes so my true capability cannot come out of this and that's when I then that's where somewhere down the line uh, somebody told me especially I would say my brother he told me that there's a financial asset by the name Bitcoin and I was like this is some geeky gaming asset you know what are you talking about uh, which year was this uh, when, you, when your brother approached you with Bitcoin this was towards 2016 and got it this got was it. before just before the frenzy you know actually started off absolutely and I was like, no, of course not. You know, I was like, you know, priding myself that having been across private equity, offshore asset management, domestic uh, asset management, lending, then finally insurance, the entire spectrum. Like, of course I know because macro was my strength, Got right, it. in many ways. So then the thing was, I deep dived into it. Let's say about four days were completely spent in terms of, you know, sleepless nights, reading through blogs, understanding what's happening out there. Got it. And uh, the next thing is I knew was I spoke to one of the, uh, you know, companies, family offices that invested into Zepay, which was the largest exchange at that particular point in time. In India, this is in India. Yeah, yes. This was in 2017. I landed up meeting with Saurabh for just like a 45 minute rapid fire conversation. And I was like amazed in two aspects. One is that in terms of what is this? It's like a network. Yes. So blockchain is a network protected by miners or whatever. Maybe proof of stake now is becoming very common these days. True. This, this makes so much sense. As a mechanical engineer, as an engineer coming from finance background, this was like a perfect scenario. The other aspect was these businesses were doing so well and they were able to scale up so fast. Yes. So I was like, how, I, how can I be part of this? And then the journey of getting the whole old hat and seeing that, can we set up a fund? Can we take care of the interest of the investors in a very compliant manner? Got it. 
and scale this up in terms of getting the investors to invest into digital assets in a very structured manner wherein we communicate like a typical VC fund. Can this journey happen? It took almost six, seven months for us to uh, conceptualize that journey and get the investment thesis right and another six months to set up. So almost after a year, so within the past four or five months, uh, we have been able to uh, close the first fund, fully deploy it into six, seven assets. So. Journey, fantastic. Journey it's a fantastic it. journey to share with us, basically, because um, looking at what is happening in the digital asset space, um, one of the things I, I, I looked at your website and at some papers is the fact that you are a multi-asset um, investment fund. What does that mean exactly? So the multi-asset is a term that I drew from the old book which was my earlier financial services uh, experience. And somebody who's a traditional fund manager Got it. will think that multi-asset means that we are investing into multiple kind of assets. That means debt, uh, stock markets, gold, real estate, and so on and so forth. ETFs, yeah. But in my view, let's, you know, let me go a little bit in detail in terms, in terms of why we call ourselves a multi-asset fund. When you are investing into a participative economy, is what I call, let's say, this entire blockchain as a space or TLT as a space, which I'm saying, mm -hmm. it's important to choose the right vehicle to invest. Yes. So when you choose token as a vehicle for investment, it is a different vehicle than choosing equity as a vehicle for investment or choosing con convertible note as a vehicle Correct. or even having security token as a vehicle. These are all different vehicles. But these vehicles determine in terms of what is the asset you create. Got it. So we are taking a step back and saying that because the decision that you're taking, let's say if you're raising through equity, the decision is many ways irreversible because that will determine your next round is also going to be equity or a composite with tokens, for example. It's very difficult to switch streams and that will de determine the destiny of the startup. So we come at a stage where we can have a conversation, understand whether there is the right fitment with the instrument that they have taken and the vehicle they have taken, which will determine the quality of the asset that they are building. Yes. So that's why we call ourselves a multi-asset fund. Got it. So, I mean, if I look at coin market cap, for example, uh, I see around 2,200 projects being listed out of there. And most of them are independent chains, which are trying to leap uh, and get market attention, basically being traded on one or many exchanges. Um, at times, it's really a jungle out of there. How can you make real good decisions which protocols or projects have really got a bright future ahead? So, uh, so I think this question can be answered by some analogies. Mm -hmm. So I think this will be valuable for people who are coming from traditional investment side. Investing in this space is no different from investing in the traditional side. Look at it this way. There are teams which are working on certain things there in, let's say, traditional space. Let's say, uh, fintech startup. I'm just giving example. Let's say, real estate also for that matter. There are teams which are working here. Yes. So the first level of due diligence is the team, which is here. Second is something which is tangible. What is tangible beyond the team, which is uh, which is very closer to the product. In case of real estate, it is the building. In case of uh, digital assets, it is the code. Got it. So let's say we have a CTO on board and the CTO looks at the code, you know, the code can't lie, right? I, I agree with you and I found it, you know, I mean, I look at traditional funds and nobody's got a CTO on, on, on board, but you guys have because you really believe looking at GitHub, looking uh, at, at, at what the code has been uh, uh, put uh, publicly, uh, which can be have looked and understood by your CTO. Absolutely. And, you know, he goes deep. So Ravindra is our CTO, he goes extremely deep in terms of we have a checklist of let's say about 125 points. And within that we look at uh, the duration of the GitHub and when it was started, the percentage of code that is out there in the market, whether the code actually works, what is the construction of the code, whether the code is written in a very simple way, it also speaks a lot about the finesse of the team which is in out there. And finally, whether the code works in a limited environment or not. So we usually sign an NDA, we get access to the private code, we take it on a machine, we test it out. Unless all of this comfort we get after talking to the team and understanding their commitment you know, towards adoption as a journey, it doesn't make sense. So this is one part. Got it. The second part is your code may be brilliant. You may be a techie, let's say out of Berkeley, Stanford or whatever it is, but ultimately rubber meets the road when you get into the fundraising and finally into adoption. So let me 
talk about even token economics correct there sure yeah so token economics plays a very important role in terms of taking a decision great code so great team great code and then uh, great token economics Got why it. token economics because here the liquidity event is happening much faster than uh, in traditional vc space yes so in traditional vc space it may be let's say 5 years 6 years maybe 3 years if it's a unicorn that you have invested into but here it could be as much as let's say 2 months 6 months maybe a year liquidity event can happen and this is what i tell even startups that is what i you know this is what i tell even other funds that when you look at token economics look at it from a duration of 5 years because once the project is committed or let's say startup is committed to a certain token economics it is irreversible it's like water under the bridge got it so we study it in terms of patterns how those token economics will pan out in terms of what potentially where the adoption can happen what could be the circulating supply which will happen later on how many validators can potentially adopt for example if say proof of stake uh, what is what is the team's capability in terms of increasing the span of the network so there are various simulations you know, that we do there very good so looking at the at the landscape of um, funds basically who are present we have the penteras of this world we have the tim drapers of this uh, andrew horwitzen is there of obviously uh, we have uh, um, Uh, Mike Novogratz uh, fund basically how are you different than these other funds which are basically there and investing into other companies so here you know a prime answer is we look up to these funds and the and the reason is because all of these funds are doing something which is very powerful let's say let me give an example let's say pentera pentera invested into uh, into the space at a very early stage yes so in many ways they have been instrumental in terms of making bitcoin important in yes. the scheme of things similarly uh, tim draper himself personally invested into bitcoin in an auction it's all public and people know about this and believer in that uh, in bitcoin as a space and you know made it big now what uh, a draper fund did was very interesting they came from the traditional space they believe in the future and they landed up investing into it right? right so it's it's i think it's a role model in many ways mike novogratz involvement in bitcoin yes ethereum uh, a core anchor and then looking forward to the next unicorns right so and so forth how we differentiate you know ourselves i don't think the word differentiation is right because the space is huge and uh, i think this is all about you know the right quality of projects getting funded and it's also about collaboration in many ways Like for example, if I may digress a bit, let's say if a startup, which is high quality startup, is let's say raising two million dollar in their one of the rounds, I mean let's say we have two million dollar within the fund, why should we be putting two million dollar fund there? You know, it doesn't make sense because this is about building a network, you know, for the DLT project. It's about maybe all of us investing into this because idea is to make the space grow and successful, and all of us unlock value together. So the differentiation. and if since you are asking the question about differentiation differentiation would be that we are emerging out of a bear market correct and whatever thesis we have got is very grounded in reality uh, our uh, relationship uh, with the lps is in terms of ensuring that their wealth creation happens and their risk management they have a lot you know very strong risk management processes very process oriented and stuff and that is what you know and we ensure that somewhere uh, it's not about discovering the next unicorn unicorns will come if there is discipline and we focus on the right process okay but the focus is that how we can ensure that when the investor money is accepted the principal is safe and there is a conscious wealth creation over a span of time so in many ways that is our focus rather than the volatility and exposing the investors to volatility over a span of time so pranav if i would invest with woodstock mm. fund um a 100000 check um how would then you, you know i mean i would be one of the uh, lps uh, how 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 do you then basically look at investing this money um uh, We, 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 you know in in the pool basically do you look at different projects is it like you know you created um uh, let's say a 5 million dollar fund that you start giving each each project where you feel um uh, which is good 50000 dollar checks or is it that you really also look at one or two projects very very and then basically fully go into it is that um, you know a, a, a approach you take towards investing so our approach is diversification so we have sectoral caps so equivalent of sectoral caps i think this is one word that 
traditional fund managers will identify with. Mm. So our focus is public DLT, DeFi, which is decentralized finance. Yes. And the third is Web 3.0, which includes protocols. Got it. Right. So within three these three areas, we have caps. So let's say in case for DeFi space, our ticket size will be much smaller. Got it. And we will be investing into many more opportunities. Got it. And working very closely with the accelerators. Yes. And focusing on building a bridge with the traditional finance. The approach is different. Yes. The second, let's say when you look at public DLT, definitely the 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 focus is on getting uh, focusing on uh, networks which can become uh, which can solve the trilemma. To put it very simple, scalability, decentralization, security. Or let's say build great peer to be a networks like Holochain, for example. Okay. Great paradigm, you know, that they are building. And uh, seeing that how they can unlock value through adoption. So there the ticket size is much, much more bigger. Because for building a network, let's say engaging with all these enterprises, it's very important for them to have that sense of financial depth, right? So we have caps at a, at, at a project level, at a stage level, at, and also at a sectoral slash uh, the one of the three areas that we're investing at that level also. Yeah. And then finally, when we do our due diligence, we also see in terms of what is the risk that we can take and what is it you know that we can do in terms of, look, ultimately VC investing is also about statistics in many ways. We are not gods, nobody is. It's all about you know creating an ecosystem of those projects which can collaborate with each other and unlock value individually as well as collectively. Got it. So I'm very happy also that you use the words DeFi because in the office at times we talk, is it now DeFi or is it DeFi? You so I mean, you know, it's like also, is it Mina or is it Mena? <laughs> uh, it's always having fun with that basically, but you used uh, DeFi as in decentralized finance um, uh, to, to, to look at. Now, one of the things I also see very quite often actually your name being uh, being related to Casper Labs and at times also Binance Lab. How is that possible? Um, are you collaborating or are you investing into the same projects basically? So uh, this is very interesting and this is a very contexted question that you know Prima has asked. I will have a separate conversation with him. You know? <laughs> so here it's a coincidence and it's somebody from Binance Lab is listening. Sorry we have not met you earlier. But the Best, but, but the coincidence is that the six of the projects that we've invested into, five of them are on with Binance Lab or Binance Launchpad. Got it. And I think it's about our investment thesis, which is working, our approach of building an ecosystem, building industry connects for projects, ensuring that they work with best of the teams, helping them with strategy, uh, referrals, and so on and so forth. I think all of that that is you know really helping in terms of discovering value yes. you know, for them. So maybe this is a medium for us to send a word out to Binance, let's collaborate. <laughs> but you know, one thing which I wanted to add is that uh, Binance uh, Lab is a accelerator. Binance has the biggest ecosystem in uh, cryptocurrency space. Yes. When I say ecosystem, it basically means that the liquidity 70%, let's say about numbers, I don't know the exact number, let's say about 70% give, give or take, liquidity is with Binance ecosystem. There are multiple verticals. Got it. Lab is one of the vertical. Launchpad is another vertical. These are the names that we listen. Exchange, of course, the third one. But there are many more. Of course. Right. And CZ has a great, great vision in terms of expanding the scope and uh, you know getting crypto mainstream, uh, which is very important for somebody within the space to do that role. But I think it is also important uh, that these projects, which are very early stage, coming from different geographies, they get the right kind of platform. So that platform is available and these initial inputs are available, but ultimately it is up to the team. So I will call them as accelerator. Got it. If you can look at Casper Lab, we are an investor in Casper Lab and we are proud to be an investor in Casper Lab. Got it. Because uh, Wall Street has invested into them and uh, also investment you know, came from Hyundai and various other you know, VC funds and so, so forth. So it's a good you know, league table that they have built. Within Casper Lab, the lab structure there is like an R&D space. Okay. So Vlad, who comes from Ethereum uh, background, right? He realized that proof of stake and there is a design called Casper has to be implemented, which can be the holy grail for Ethereum. It's like Ethereum 3.0. Okay. So, but that shift, he uh, sort of focused on building a separate chain, which is called you know Casper uh, Lab. You know, within Casper Lab, you know, building that uh, specific uh, blockchain. The blockchain focuses on solving trilemma, the design is ready, it's got you know major investment you know, out there, the team is out there in the market reaching out to people. So for us it is about running a validator node and also you know working very closely with the team in terms of expanding the ecosystem in Middle East and India. 
then let's say coming to Woodstock Fund, I think where we are unique, I think you asked here, asked this question uh, previously as to what is what is it that differentiates us. I think what differentiates us is that our we focus on building ecosystem. Like I mean, it doesn't make sense. For example, let's say Elrond team is also you know with us you know right now while we came here. Uh, most of the projects will not do that. It's like let let's focus on the next project. Let's keep on building the portfolio but my focus is that can we build an ecosystem can we unlock value and within that goodwill and interactions on the fund side fundraising as well as fund deployment getting best of the projects everything becomes seamless so so that's our strategy that's a core part of our strategy yes it's not about charging projects for all of this that's not the game that we are in I mean, I come from traditional side and for me it's about contributing to the ecosystem so that the ecosystem grows and various people within the ecosystem genuinely benefit so that we as a space, uh, crypto as a space moves from speculative to, to largely true value creation mode. And that is where I think all of us will grow and uh, do extremely well. Got it. So um, looking at what is happening right now, basically we see Blockstack just doing in uh, in the US, a Reggae Plus uh, race, basically. For the first time, there, there, there were uh, obviously um, uh, closed door uh, um, where they had um, bigger funds basically looking into their project. And now they did a Reggae Plus looking at the public and, and racing uh, with Reggae Plus, uh, uh, um, I think it was 30 million um, for, 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 their, um, for, for their race, which has been... Um, done very successfully, but more importantly, it's done in a regulated way. Yeah. And uh, out of the US, as you guys know, SEC can be very, very stringent when it comes to these things. But more importantly is the fact that this is now actually one of the first times where we see a regulated project coming out to retail customers and raising money. Um, do you feel that this trend will continue? I truly believe that uh, this trend will definitely continue. This trend will become extremely big because uh, tokenization is bound to happen in many ways because it makes so much sense to have distributed ownership. It makes logical sense from a risk management perspective. It also makes a lot of sense from a quantum of fundraising perspective. Okay. Let's say even as a VC, I have limitations in terms of caps, putting a certain check. But let's say if somebody requires a significantly large amount to take their business global, they may require larger money and this money has to come from individuals. Now, if it comes, when we looked at, let's say way back 2017, it came through the ICO route. Yes. Now, if you look at the ICO route, investors have no recourse in many ways, right? And in many ways, the investment process that I mentioned to you is the only way to do a due diligence and sort of, you know, work along with the team. So it's like there are multiple ways in which you can like ensure that protect your investment. You protect your investment by looking at the team, looking at the code, looking at the economics, and looking at you know building an ecosystem. A conscious team will keep on jumping these hurdles and you know walking with you, you know which is capable. And that also gives you a moment of truth. Now, in the, in, now, now it's like, if tokenization is the wave, which is going to uh, be the future, then it is very clear that regulation, uh, regulatory framework has to emerge. And US, been, US has been a torchbearer in this space. So in many ways, the Reg D regulations, you know, uh, created that space wherein uh, you can create, you can raise money from public. And of course, there are certain constraints in terms of disclosure, in terms of you know recourse and various other things that you have to meet. There's a lot of criteria which is there, but it, it's an open architecture in many ways, which is a regulatory scope which has been created, so that you can involve public into participation into a network or let's say an entity like this. It actually it goes beyond even blockchain space in many ways. And this is going to become, you know, huge for sure. Having said that, the core blockchain ethos of public participation without presence of government is also going to be there. And the reason is that I'm not talking about privacy issues or let's say concealing and all that stuff. I'm a big believer in autonomous applications versus anonymous applications. I don't think anonymous applications is going to be the future. Autonomous applications make so much sense, wherein individuals can participate because the regulation this is going to, not going to be a single standard of regulations. Mm -hmm. So utility tokens are going to be there. And uh, so utility token, uh, they're going to become more mature, succeed, and definitely the security tokens are also going to become more mature and succeed. Maybe what will happen is that, let's say funds like us, you know, once we scale till a certain point, we will securitize our entire fund base. 
Got it. So from a normal investor perspective, they'll be holding security rather than holding equity token. Uh, sorry, a utility token. token. Yeah. So that's how I see this world, you know, panning out. Uh, so that's what makes me bullish, and that also partially answers the first question that you had as to why did I make the shift. I wanted to be part of the future rather than to be part of the past. <laughs> Wonderfully said, uh, Pranav. So we talked about the present, we talked about the future. I just want to talk about the past still. I want to talk about the past performance of the fund. Um, could you let us know that, you know, what kind of performance did you guys do in the last uh, 12 months, 6 to 12 months? So uh, it's been a phenomenal ride for us in a bear market, I'll put it this way. So we made uh, six investments. Okay. First was Holochain. Holochain went all the way till it's about 20x or something. Right now it's about, let's say about 5 to 6x multiple. I'm talking about dollar returns because we're talking to people who understand dollars. Got right? it. Got I don't it. talk about E3M or BTC peg here. Yes. Right? That's another asset class from our perspective. Second is we invested in Elrond. This was even before Binance Launchpad or any of the VCs you know, came in because we believed in the team and we wanted to work together. And uh, they got listed on Binance and then they are, let's say, about at 5x, they went all the way till, let's say, about 12x. So both of these projects have given, uh, let's say, about 5 to 6x. Actually, much more because, you know, we have been able to, there's always this market. Of, of course, movement you know, is and stuff. And, you know, we made much more. And the principle, I'll put it this way, that the principle of investors is back. Got it. That's there. The third investment uh, that we made uh, was into Marlin Protocol, once again a Binance Lab project. Binance Lab happened much more later after we started working and helping the team. We actually took the team here to Dubai to you know help them to raise funds and stuff, have been advising them token economics, working with them as to what could be the strategy and stuff, you know, much before all of this frenzy and you know Marlin tokens you know became valuable in people's mind. Then we invested into Helis. Helis is uh, this is a very prodigy team in terms of building a uh, DeFi stack and within, uh, sorry, DeFi platform and within that DeFi uh, they have built stacks of products, a payroll product, a lending product, very closely working with the team to take them forward. They're doing POCs. Give you a lot of confidence and faith. Sequoia in India invested into Band Protocol, which is a token investment. Okay. Right? Now Sequoia India my senses has their LP sitting in US. So I'm sure the investment committee in US also gave a green signal to invest. So even the traditional funds are getting into this, right? And band protocol is now getting listed on Binance yes. on uh, 19th, uh, 18th, 19th. Fantastic. So it's like for us, it's almost like Yuvarat Singh kind of a batting. It's almost <laughs> like, you know, it's, it's working out, you know, well for us. There's one more interesting investment that we'll make. Uh, you still, you know, hear about it. I can't share it right now in a public forum. But uh, this is, uh, we are investing in the same round wherein uh, the likes of Naval Ravikant, Balaji, they are investing, uh, uh, Balaji of Coinbase and dot. Got it, got it, got it. So yes. uh, we have been blessed and I will also take some credit by saying that our investment process is working for us. Fantastic. I mean, it's really been a fantastic journey. Uh, again, I have to say, you know, this market has been... Um, a bear market uh, uh, in the last uh, 18 months. So um, having such performance, uh, uh, can I say 5x on, on, on general or 6x? Let's say about, you can say 6 to 7x because mm -hmm. we cashed out. That is just totally amazing to have such kind of returns and that your due diligence process has been so thorough that you were able to spot out the real winners in this game and able to look at it um, as, as it goes. Now, the last question before I let you go is about VCs, basically. So do you see more VCs looking at the crypto market, the digital asset market, as a real opportunity for them to invest in? I think uh, if I may have slightly longer response to this. Sure. So coming from, I was in uh, VC private equity space as the starting part of my career, which is, let's say, almost a decade and a half back. This is traditional VC space. And uh, what I see is that it's very interesting how the space is panning out. There, is, there are two things which is very interesting. One thing is that the cycle has become much longer for let's say an angel investor to unlock value. Mm. So the money is stuck in many ways. Yes. So the liquidity cycle is very long and everyone has limitations in the value chain, whether it is an angel investor, a seed investor, or let's say a fund, or even an investor who is out there in the market. There's yes. a limitation that you know he or she has in terms of investing. So the cycle has become longer. 
second is which i don't know whether i should say this or not but this is my experience and uh, i'm happy to interact with anybody who wants to uh, i think there's a venture bubble which is there so there are lot of you know uh, uh, traditional space mm-hmm. so there are lot of uh, projects you know and all, uh, sorry lot of startups which are getting more funding than they actually require it is blowing up their valuations become in so, sort of a mu- musical chair and why it is happening because there's tremendous amount of liquidity out there in the market and it is chasing fewer assets Cool. right now i'm not taking any names but just giving an example that for example let's say we works when we mm-hmm. works got listed the valuation has been slashed by 50% why is it happening because uh, the valuation has to be commensurate with the value which is which is discovered by the market that's why the word va- valuation term valuation true so in many ways i i mean we are seeing that the current vc fund uh, traditional vc space is going to transform yeah because their lps are going to ask for shorter liquidity cycles they are asking for more reasonable valuation where they can invest and they are going to ask for more active managers which are adding value rather than just building a statistical base so this is the traditional vc space so traditional vc space uh, eventually will accept more and more investment in this crypto as a space or let's say blockchain as a space the second point i want to make you know here is that uh, this this is a market whether there's a there's a cloth market there is a vegetable market there is a cryptocurrency market or there is yes. a securities market right this market is ever growing any market has potential for participation now when the market will become regulated like the way you asked you know, semi regulated i'm putting this way i won't even use the word regulated i will say better governance okay rather than imposed governance there could be self governance and it could be even governance by the community also which can happen yeah right let's say as more and more pe- people become aware in terms of what can token economics work what is the github they you know work closely with programmers and stuff and so on and so forth you know the space will become very efficient so it's classic classical efficient market hypothesis as the market goes from inefficiency to efficiency definitely it will attract tremendous amount of interest because the world is flush with liquidity out there and uh, one of the reason we believe that high quality projects will extremely do well because once they embark on the uh, adoption journey they'll become extremely valuable to traditional vcs to come in you know there so i just mentioned two things just to summarize one is in the traditional vc space uh, there are limitations and these limitations are solved by being participating to whatever extent you can into this space it could be a 5% allocation it could be a 10% or it could be a joint venture working together you know to participate in this particular space with a fund of course who understands your rhythm yes. your lps and risk management and so on and so forth and the second part is that this space is going to stay expand grow and become more efficient absolutely pranav it's been absolutely a pleasure to talk to you There's so many things we still have to talk about but in your next trip to dubai we have to meet again i think everybody for looking right now um it's uh, it's been an enormous journey for you guys and i really hope to see more success stories like this in the near future thank you very much prem i think we need to have many more such forums so that the good word can spread about this space and that there are good people who are doing the right things also and like you absolutely and thank you, you as well much. pranav thank you thank you pleasure absolutely